Welcome to The Happy Doc, the voice of fulfilled physicians. This show is about bringing inspirational, creative, successful, and happy health professionals to you. Get ready to learn how you can be a happy doctor too. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of The Happy Doc. Before we begin, I want to introduce our next guest, who's going to be Marika Lindholm. And she's really amazing. Um, I know you guys will love this interview. She started Esme, which is empowering solo moms everywhere. And here's a little bit of a blurb from her website in the explanation of it. It says, Esme is a social platform dedicated to solo moms who face the challenge of solo parenting in a society that provides little help or guidance. Mothers on their own, whether by choice or circumstance, parent approximately 22 million American children. So that's a quick blurb about it, but basically it's a community website which solves um, or works on the issue of being a solo mom and how do you get through that. So you get to connect, you get to build a community, and that's really exciting uh, for us to find out more about Esme. And the great um, collaboration with this is the fact that there's many solo moms in the physician space. Um, And so I think this is a great conversation for those solo mothers out there for sure. So Marika, she has a PhD in sociology and she combines that skill um, utilizing her uh, research skills in sociology um, with a problem that she personally faced, her own struggles, and she combined those two things together to create this website. So we get into uh, that concept of taking some of your skills and, and building something that can help the masses. Um, One of the tips that she leaves for the listeners today, and you guys will hear about it during the interview, is practicing self-care. She says, practice self-care through mindfulness. Love yourself. Forgive yourself. Say no to the things your gut is telling you not to do. Each time you practice self-care and self-love, you feel better. You'll be a better person and things will overflow so you can give to others. And why do we love having Marika on? Marika developed this wonderful community page that provides connection and community for solo mothers everywhere. Marika took her own struggle, and through her experience, she created something to help the masses. Marika is an inspiration for everyone. So get ready for this awesome episode. And before we get to it, I want to call out all solo mom doctors. Are you a solo mom who also practices as a physician? We would love to hear from you. Please send us a message to the Happy Doc Facebook page, the Twitter page, or email us at thehappydoc1 at gmail.com. Let us know what your questions are for Marika. Let us know how we can connect you to her and what she's doing. Let us know about your struggles and what do you wish you had more information on as a solo mother. Please check out esme.com and let's get ready for this awesome episode. Hello, everyone. This is Taylor, and this is another episode of The Happy Doc. I'm absolutely excited to have our next guest, and that's Marika Lindholm. And the reason I'm excited about Marika is she has this awesome page. It's called Esme, or Empowering Solo Moms Everywhere. Um, We'll definitely get into that in this conversation. And uh, it's an absolute pleasure to have you, Marika, today. How are you doing? I'm well. Thanks for having me, Taylor. Awesome. Awesome. Great to have you. So, uh, Marika, before we begin and jump into your page, um, can you uh, give us a little glimpse of kind of your professional background and how, not to tell you, not to get to exactly how we started the page itself, but just um, how your career started to flourish. And I know you, I see, okay, Doctor of Philosophy and Sociology, but so can we touch in on um, how you got your interest in sociology? Sure. Um, I am a child of two Swedish immigrants and uh, came to the United States when I was really young. And being the parent of immigrants creates a pretty unique situation in which you're translating for them, or a child of immigrants, pardon me. Um, You know, you translate for them and you kind of have to figure out the world. And so from an early age, I was really interested in trying to figure out how American society was working and 
Um, I think, you know, I started as an English major in college and then suddenly I took a sociology class and like my mind was blown because it was so uh, helpful to explain kind of the feelings I had about being, you know, kid of two Swedish parents and the feelings I saw in terms of comparing Swedish society with American society and diversity. And so uh, it just, I knew the minute I took a sociology class, this is something that was uh, something I was going to pursue. So Wow. Uh, you know, got the, my PhD and then started teaching at Northwestern and just, uh, you know, it's a, an area I feel very passionate about. It was great. I love teaching and, you know, like that just uh, was a natural segue to what I'm doing now. That's awesome. And so I know very little actually about Swedish culture. So can you tell me like, you know, what are some of the differences um, that you experienced between, um, you know, typical American culture and Swedish culture? Well, I can tell you a story of when I was very young where um, I was brought to a local public pool and my parents only put a swim bottom on me <laughs> and uh, <you> know, <laughs> and was horrified to, you know, be made fun of and learn that, no, no, in America, kids wear tops and bottoms when they're girls. But, um, you know, the main difference was that my parents were, you know, pretty shy and reticent. And, you know, we lived, moved to New York City and suddenly you had to really fight for your space and to to move forward. And, but then later on, I actually did my dissertation on Scandinavian politics. And, um, Mm. and uh, my main question was, you know, they have uh, so much gender equality there and women, um, you know, and men both take maternity and paternity leave. And I was just trying to understand how they got to that point because, um, you know, what were the differences with American culture? So it's uh, obviously, I've been doing this comparison my whole life. (laughs) All right, everyone. So you guys don't know this, but we actually dropped out of the phone call for a little bit, had some technical difficulties. But uh, I was talking to Marika about the difference between uh, Swedish culture and American culture. And uh, I was making an assumption, but I was saying that maybe, uh, you know, the American culture, uh, we're a lot less active in Swedish culture. Um, It's more embedded that you'd be active in the culture. There's more movement. Is there more focus on nutrition and those types of things as well? Uh, yeah, absolutely. But I also want to point out that nature is so important to Swedish culture and being outdoors. And so there's even a, a term called vedra, which means that you open the windows every day and even in negative 20 degrees. You know, so it's also being out in nature and walking and enjoying you know, the environment. So I've really taken that in living my life on a farm, et cetera. So I just want to say that my upbringing uh, you know, being out and walking and my 80 year old grandfather walking every day. And so Yes. Coupled with that, nutrition is super important. Uh, They're very aware of what's healthy. I think my grandparents talked about organic food way before I ever heard about it in the United States. Mm. Uh, They're very aware of, uh, you know, what you should eat. And they're very worried. I remember in my grandparents' home, we wouldn't wash with uh, detergent. And I thought it was so strange. And they're like, oh, no, it's really bad for your body and the environment. So Mm. I think they were, you know, way ahead of the curve with a lot of those issues. Wow. For sure. Yeah. yeah, no, I just um, I just think about American culture and, uh, you know, everyone is <clears throat> very hesitant to not everyone, but, you know, the even the scientific culture, very hesitant to adapt, you know, uh, those ki- that kind of thinking, saying it's, um, you know, a lot of times pseudoscience, you know, they're like, oh, the research studies don't show it. I don't know. It's just it's just interesting to me. Um, and I, have you heard of I believe the term is blue zones. Is that correct? Do you know what I'm talking about? Um it's essentially, I might be butchering this, but it's areas of the world in which certain cultures, um, the individuals there live for a long period of time. Um, and I don't know if it's, you know, the Swedish culture is one of them, but, um, basically it's talking about things that you're discussing, like, um, getting in, uh, time to be part of nature, um, you know, eating very healthy community is really huge as well. Um, you know, where community is kind of embedded in, um, the culture, the, these people tend to live longer, um, regardless of, you know, some other factors. So, uh, it's definitely something that's an interesting thing. I'm I'm wondering if, you know, discussing this, if that's the case, it's unfortunate. Well, Uh, I I would love to speak about the community aspect because, uh, you know, the, in Sweden, the, they call themselves folkhemet and folkhemet means people's home. And people's the idea of the community taking care of each other and taking care of those who are weak and vulnerable obviously plays into a lot of the politics. But so um, that 
community feeling is I, we know that it has health benefits, right? You, you yeah. know that as well. And so the, when there is a sense that, you know, you will be taken care of whether you're ill, whether you're going through a hard time or whether you're just aging. Uh, I've watched, you know, my great aunts and uncles and grandparents in the aging process there. And just the homes that they create are more like actual homes. Mm. And, you know, they have people come in and, um, you know, who, I mean, or they have people, I have a great aunt who the, actually, the, they will drive to her home every day and just hang out with her so she could stay in her home. There's just a really different approach to the vulnerable population and then community is such a big part of that. So, yeah. Yeah. And you know, I'm, I'm really happy we're bringing this up because, you know, one of the reasons that um, I even went out to create the happy doc was because the culture of medicine and it is a culture, you know, people are working in it all the time. Me, you know, spending more hours in the hospital, for example, than they might even do at home. And uh, that culture um, is something that I think does lack those qualities. Um, you know, it's, um, and I don't know how aware you are in terms of the physician population, but it's a culture which a lot of times I feel like people feel very judged. They don't always feel supported. Um, they can feel very, um, drained in the work that they do. They feel very exhausted in the work that they do. Um, it's pretty unfortunate. Um, and unfortunately, it's actually just a, a reflection of what's going on in American society in general. I mean, I've written quite a bit about sleep deprivation and the you know work that we don't take actual vacations and that we're constantly plugged in. I mean, in Sweden, it's six weeks vacation and the productivity isn't any lower there. Uh, it's just actually you're recharged. So, um, you know, I've really learned a lot by watching my cousins as they you know, hang out for a couple of weeks or three weeks, four weeks. And then, I mean, they have very high level jobs and they function in society. And in America, we are, just feel like we would just, you know, somehow shrivel up and die if we, you know, suddenly unplug for two or three weeks. We're just really afraid to unplug. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I don't know, you know, oftentimes, like, I think if someone's going on vacation, I don't know if it's always the case, but um, sometimes I feel like there's a, a little bit of a feeling of jealousy. You know, like, oh, that person takes off and, you know, I need to uh, pick up their slack and those types of things. Um, my understanding in a lot of these cultures is it's encouraged, right? Like, oh, you're going to, you know, you're going to Germany for a week or two weeks or whatever, or you're going there. Um, you know, there's a sense of like, yeah, you should go do that. Is that, would, would you say that's the case? Yeah, hundred percent. It's just so deeply embedded as a normal part of your life. Being human requires that you go and regroup and recharge, go out and go skiing or go. I mean, they have, they have, uh, their school is organized these around these long vacations as well so that the kids do get three weeks off in the winter. And, you know, in the summer, there's a long vacation. So it's a very human family oriented approach. And so, you know, you're not getting angry and jealous if someone's going. It's just like what you do. Right. It's not it's norm normative. Yeah. I mean, and, you know, as we're talking about this, like so I'm I'm always thinking ahead. Right. So um, I, you know, I think that's the way that things need to move. And I know it's very like, um, you know, idealistic. And I think I am, a, you know, somewhat idealistic, but we're going to have to come up with more sustainable models um, in many cultures in American society. And I think, you know, ultimately we need to be emulating uh, some of these cultures and these countries that are implementing things that work in a more humanistic, you know, fashion. Um, and to, uh, as a perfect segue, I'm talking about physicians, um, but a big, you know, part of the work you're doing is with solo moms. And I think these are people that are very strapped. You know, they have to support a family on top of being a mother. Uh, can you maybe, I don't know if you, you want to try to, but compare some of the things we're already talking about with solo moms. Well, I mean, uh, we have 23 million children being raised by moms on their own. And uh, these moms generally do not have the best financial situation. We know that the single moms, solo moms are the poorest demographic in American society. They're not necessarily guaranteed health insurance. They are often working two jobs at, you know, and with unequal gender pay and in low income jobs. I mean, it's so they are bearing the burden of raising children and doing the best that they can and, and under very stressful conditions. And so, you know, a lot of them are doing a great job, but a lot of them are also facing some of the things you would expect, like depression, like stress, like anxiety, being overworked, not 
not taking care of themselves. So, you know, we try it as many very hard to try to, uh, you know, encourage self-care and en- encourage them to understand that they can't do the best job with their children unless they start to really a- attend to their own emotional and physical needs. Mm-hmm. Definitely. So let's take a step back. Um, you know, so we're touching on Esme um, a little bit. Can you can you tell us how this developed, you know, um, you being the founder and everything? How did this develop from your life or, you know, how did this come about? Yeah, I'd be happy to. Uh, it was a very personal journey that I took. I had a three and a five year old and I was a professor at Northwestern University and married to another professor. And, you know, everything was pretty smooth. But then it, our marriage fell apart. And um, I, unlike some of these moms, had a good job and I did have health insurance. But what I found was that it was incredibly daunting it was emotionally exhausting. It was much, much more difficult. I'm a you know strong woman, athlete, feminist, you know, Swede, <laughs> sturdy Swede, and still uh, I kind of fell apart. You know, I, I had you know they wouldn't have known it at work because of course you don't show that, but at home I was really struggling and I was struggling with the new financial reality and I ended up getting pretty sick. I just became very, very vulnerable. And um, during those dark nights before they could figure out, I mean, it was just a pretty simple fix. It was a blood disorder that, um, you know, I ended up taking medication. And I was talking about it took nine months to figure out why I had high fevers and rashes. And it was mm. scary. I was really feeling very vulnerable. Yeah. And um, I made this vow to myself, I could ever help other moms not go through this. I was going to do that. Wow. Yeah. So flash forward 15 years and um, now I've, trying to create that community, create that, um, you know, what I, what the support that I so felt that I needed at the time. That's, that's phenomenal. I mean, that's so powerful because you're coming from a very personal viewpoint, you know, going through this struggle. Thank you for sharing, by the way. That's amazing. (laughs) Um, and it's so powerful because you're coming from a very authentic place. You were hurt. You went through this very difficult situation and now you've created this platform to connect with soul moms. And actually I have the page open I'm just kind of scrolling through it. And it's great. You have all these. I mean, I'm looking at this real time right now. You have like, for example, this article, how to prevent your mental health issues from affecting your children, you know? So for example, with that article, you have um, a woman who might be dealing with a lot. And then what are the strategies um, to, you know, help to make sure that you're not affecting your children in that state of mind, so to speak. Um, That's, that's really great. So how did this um, site grow for you? How did you develop it? Well, as a sociologist, you do your homework. And what I did was focus groups. I did focus groups in LA and New York and Chicago. And I talked to solo moms. They're all different moms who are either single or divorced or widowed or, you know, solo by choice. And I just started to hear what they wanted and what they needed. And it really grew out of that. Um, Mm. And had I known... (laughs) how much work or that, you know, the dedication required. I mean, I might've been scared to do it, but I really wasn't just had an idea and just ran with it. And, you know, I learned a tremendous amount and it's every day. uh, It's pretty amazing. And last week we helped a woman, she was on our Facebook group and she did not have, um, she had mastitis Mm. and did not. And she was on antibiotics and they didn't want her to nurse. She actually did not have money to buy formula Oh wow! until so it was like two or three days later. And so we shipped her a CVS card and she was able to get the formula. I mean, that's the kind of thing where you're just like, like immediate impact, you know? Yeah. And that's so awesome. <laughs> yeah. 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 I mean, and uh, again, it's funny. We're just coming back to the idea of community. Um, mm-hmm. You know, you've created a culture within, you know, soul mom community, right? So and now all these people can connect. I'm assuming the, these are people that connected g- digitally, not necessarily physically. Correct. Well, we um, have chat rooms and we, we call tribes on the site. And then we have Facebook local groups. But now we're doing something as may in real life where we're taking the, the local groups and there we have something called Esme Cafe where they're starting to meet. It's very new. Oh, it's that's been, so cool. I know in Chicago, they've, they're already on their third get together and they're, mm. it's just been really powerful to hear about them and watch, watch these groups. But yeah, so we do it. It's in real time and it's also digitally. Yeah. That's so cool. So you have, yeah. so you, you've created an online platform with the website. You have Facebook groups. You have the Esme Cafe. So you're, you're connecting people with great information. You have um, other areas for them to reach out personally and then creating physical contacts as well. Is there any other part of the page that, you know, maybe I've missed? 
Well, I mean, we have 20 guides that have personal and professional experience with a variety of issues. So like, mm-hmm. for example, uh, adoption, you know, well-being, public assistance, uh, d- you know, uh, domestic violence, divorce. Mm-hmm. So, you know, we have these you know, touch points where, say, in the middle of the night, you have a question. We always will have some expert who can, you know, we try not to rely on experts only. It's most, mostly a ground up kind of thing where the moms mm-hmm. are helping each other. Mm-hmm. But it's really great to have someone there. And, you know, when there's a complicated question and the guys are always there and can, can help out. So, wow. yeah, that's awesome. So um, hypothetical situation now, let's say we have a listener uh, listening to the podcast and she is a solo mom. Okay. And she's having difficulty. Maybe she's a practicing physician or she's a new resident. She's maybe feeling exhausted, tired. She's trying to balance out, you know, having maybe a love life, you know, dealing with work, having kids. Um, you know, what, what are the next steps for someone who's, who's really struggling like that? Besides coming to the site? No, I mean, I mean, you can mention the site. I'm yeah, just saying yeah, like, yeah. what, what, do, what do you like? Cause I'm, I'm sure that's a very typical presentation for you. So like what what are some some pieces of advice or or ways that you think people can kind of get out of that situation? Well, the, the first thing is just to uh, be able to go somewhere to talk about it. Right. Just be able to vent, be able. And we have a confidential community. So sometimes people don't want to be identified when they're laying out some of the problems and stresses. Mm-hmm. And then it's hoping, you know, then the other moms can weigh in and support them and say, like, I, I understand I've been there. But then we also, um, you know, there's that self-care piece, like just that mindfulness of taking a moment and just, you know, being, you know, have the gratitude or have uh, optimism. And there's just ways, I mean, we have, there's lots of articles on our site about it and I could talk probably for days about yeah. these kinds of things. I just wrote a piece today about, um, for psychology today of 10 ways that parents can practice self-love. Mm. And so I really believe that you're a better parent if you are more forgiving, more optimistic, um, you know, learn to say no, uh, there's just a variety of ways that you can love yourself and treat yourself better. And it's going to overflow to your children. And yeah. so, you know, um, you know, and we have on the site a lot of different ways that you can do things inexpensively, like your own spa day or, yeah. <laughs> you know, it does everything. You don't have to have a lot of money necessarily to take care of yourself. So, yeah, definitely. And I think I've, I've found this, you know, through, you know, the work that I'm doing. Um, and I'm sure this is going to echo in what you're doing. But, you know, a big, you know, ultimate theme, I think, is the more you work on yourself and the better you find peace in the things that you're doing, the better you're able to give to others. Would you agree with that, like, basic theme? 100 percent, 110 percent. I just was thinking about um, there's some women who we are now writing articles about who have been homeless, who've been victims of domestic violence, and they've turned it around and become and the way they turned it around was by giving back. And doing wonderful work and just, I mean, there's just so inspiring. And I've been thinking a lot about that, how, you know, you can heal by giving and being outward directed and working on yourself at the same time. But yeah, I think all of these things play together and you just, um, it's when people are stuck and that's the hard part. And part of Esme, I believe, is like getting women unstuck and sort of like open themselves up to, you know, you, this isn't a permanent situation, how horrible you feel right now it doesn't have to be that way you will feel better we will tell you over and over you will feel better so i think that's just the sort of just something that's very important when you see people i'm sure you talk to people all the time or maybe there's you know medical students who are just like i just don't know any other way right and they have to find a journey or a path that's different it's so funny so i i think it's funny i'm sure we're going to connect a lot on this we're working in different areas but we're working in a specific area where there's like a, I would say a spiritual or emotional debt or feeling of, you know, extreme loss in some way. And people are just trying to get out and trying to recover. And the same words you're using for these solo moms and like, for example, trying to pull them out and give them, you know, ways to maybe change the way they look at things or work in a different way. It's the almost exact same advice I'm giving some of the medical students I'm working with, some of the doctors I'm speaking to. Um, I, I, th- I mean, I think it's just interesting that that's kind of, uh, we're very, there's a lot of commonalities within that. It's, it's funny. Yeah. I do feel like modern society has driven us to this condition 
And um, I'm not one of those people who's like thinking, talking about the good old days, but I do believe that it's gotten with the global economy, everything's gotten so complex and we demand so much. And with social media, et cetera, we're just bombarded, bombarded and the technology moving us forward. So I think that, you know, it's not surprising to me as a sociologist that different groups would be suffering some of the same malaise. Mm -hmm. Right. But I do. Yeah. I mean, um, of course, we have a different focus, but I do think that ultimately it's sort of the same sort of advice at each each stage yeah no i mean i just i just find it fascinating so you were mentioning um an example um kind of you're alluding to some examples can you think of a really powerful example of maybe someone who went onto your page and and went onto it um and found like significant change yeah, I mean, there's quite a few, but one that just came to mind was um, we have some videos of moms t- talking about their greatest challenge and they're what they're most proud of. And one of our the moms talked about getting her college diploma while she had, a, I think, a six-month-old and then the three-year-old. And she said, this is my proudest moment. And then we heard later that another mom had been so inspired by that that she went back to get her degree. So, I mean, that things like that happen all the time. We hear, um, you know, people just write to us all the time and say, you know, I I never thought that I could do this. There's been some people who've now started their own businesses because we feature a lot of uh, solo mom entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. And um, so, yeah, if it's based, oh, and of course the ones that, you know, we don't talk about on the site as much in terms of public, public forum, but women leaving violent situations you know, because other moms have told them how to do it safely. Yeah. And we have articles about that as well. And just, um, you know, that that's one of the things that is very powerful when you know that someone has created a safe place for their family and when they weren't safe before. Mm. Yeah, maybe. I mean, uh, I definitely don't go as much in the dark realm, but I think it, it's definitely worth talking about. Um, especially like with the whole thing on social media with the, the me too campaign and hashtag me too and everything going on there. So, um, obviously a terrible situation when you have, for example, I mean, it doesn't have to be, uh, just women, but obviously it tends to be women. Um, how, how, again, like how does one get out of a situation like that? Or what, what is a step that someone could take? Again, if they're listening to a conversation like this or knows of someone, how do they help help that population? It's very tricky and it's not something that, you know, you can just have one answer to. Sure. But the first the first answer is, you know, call a domestic violence hotline, you know, just to reach out and start. And then, you know, there are things that you, you it's you can only you can really know if, if it's completely a dangerous situation to leave. So you usually have to establish a lot of things beforehand. You've got to figure out financial piece. You need to figure out where you're going to go. You're going to have to figure out what, who your support system is. There's just yeah. a lot. Yeah. It's not something that I would feel comfortable being like, Oh, just do this because yeah. there, there are women who just leave impulsively because they're scared. And then it ends up being, you know, I mean, there's just, I, really, really horrible consequences. So it's something that you, you, there's planning involved and there's support involved. And then we, I mean, we have a lot of information about that on the site. Yeah. I mean, yeah, yeah. now that I like, we we just bring it up and I'm starting to think about it it just would be, I mean, obviously the scenarios are very different. Like you're saying uh, to be, but here's what I'm thinking is to be under that tremendous amount of stress and still create a plan and think clearly and then not only that, but have the courage and the bravery to execute those steps in a situation like that, especially if kids are involved. Like that's, I yeah. mean, that's nuts. That's well, like, we have a whole domestic violence section and we have um, over 5,000 nonprofits. And so there are organizations that help women through this. And there we have, you know, you can look up these organizations by state and um, you know, our guide who works for the site, she herself was a, um, in a, situation of domestic violence and she's mm. one of those people I was talking about who turned it around and she was in a homeless a battered women's shelter and started to do art wow. and then now she goes and help now she's totally moved forward sells 
her art and is very successful with her, her art, but then always gives back and goes into shelters around the Chicago area and, and, and you know, probably other places as well and uses art to help women recover and heal. Wow. So talking about, you know, very profound, um, you know, changes that were positive coming from a place that seemed like there was no hope. Uh, you know, we have a lot of stories like that. So that's what we're hoping, you know, we, instead of, you know, always focusing on like, oh, the, the this very scary ones, we like show women who could do it and where they are now and that mm -hmm. you might, and, you know, other women will chime in and just say, yeah, we were there. We know what it was like. And yeah. And, and, you know, those exam and that's why I love, you know, hearing about some of these examples, like, those examples are like, you know, that bridge, you know, like, I don't think I can do it. I don't think I can do it. Right. But we're again, community reconnecting to a space where people can find other strong examples or people who've already experienced this, you know, or mentorship, you know, having that mentor or idea to reach towards of someone who's already completed something that you're trying to get towards. Um, even in the realm of domestic violence, for example, um, is it, so huge. And that's why, like, just talking about this idea with Esme, it's it's such an amazing project you have done. I mean, uh, it's it's literally life saving. I mean, it's awesome. Um, obviously, we're talking about this uh, in a conversation, but um, I can't speak uh, as a solo mom. It's, it's out of my place. But, um, you know, if I were to be in that position, it sounds like a really great resource. It gets me very excited. So um, to I, I, I love big ideas like this. And obviously, um, I'm a big idea guy. So how did you um, I want to dig a little bit deeper into how did you develop a project like this? You talked about those focus groups, but this wasn't just on your own. Right. So what were the, some of the challenges going in? Um, taking your struggle and developing it into a concept you thought could help a lot of people? Well, I had too many ideas in the beginning, <laughs> right? <laughs> Focus groups are uh, great for giving you lots of ideas, but, you know, I wanted to do everything. I was like, oh, we need to do, you know, an, an exchange between moms. We need to do this. I mean, it was just, I had a, we had a whiteboard with so many, so many ideas. Mm -hmm. uh, so it was sort of just first starting with what we thought was most important and essential. And I knew resources were important. So the first thing I did was we hired a bunch of grad students to come up with a list of nonprofits. You know, I knew that I wanted to build a database that was just useful, very practical. And then I also knew I wanted to address that the other sides of these women's personalities. So we actually focus on art and music and mm -hmm. literatures because I understood that over and over I heard them saying I do, I'm not just a single mom I'm not just a single mom so I wanted to address that they were there was other parts of who they were whether they were creative or just appreciated creativity so they were just I it was slowly deciding you know what was most important what was most essential to provide and I knew that uh, because of those middle of the night scary moments for me that I wanted a place where someone could in the middle of the night reach out mm. and get and get, know that someone was there mm. you know and so that was the idea with the chat rooms and also distinguishing that one mom's experience is different than another's. So, for example, uh, we have many women on the site who are raising kids with special needs. Well, that's a very unique, stressful scenario. And I wanted them to be able to connect in their own, you know, we call them tribes, but I wanted them to be able to quickly be able to find each other. Mm -hmm. You know, we, you know, we have moms, solo moms with cancer. We have solo moms with, you know, psychological challenges. And so that was the other piece. So it really came out of like this blend of what I had learned and what I had experienced and then sort of distilling what was most important and then slowly developing. And, you know, I started with um, getting the resources and then making a team, putting a team together and then hiring moms to write for us. We publish over a hundred articles a month. Well, maybe it's, you know, around there, but, um, and that's so great because the mission fits with it. These, these are moms that are able to make a little bit of extra money writing when their kids asleep or when mm -hmm. their kids at soccer practice. So, you know, just the whole organization itself is playing out in the mission as well. Like we, mm -hmm. we're very sympathetic to if they miss a deadline or during the holidays or the summer, you know, it's just so great to be able to, you know, have that, in terms of our culture of the work environment as well. So sure. Win, yeah. Wins all around. It sounds like we try. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, I'm really interested, um, in, 
taking a step back, we were talking about focus groups. So it sounds like that's a really essential part of taking an idea and developing it. Um, you know, because what you were kind of talking about is the fact that, um, you had too many ideas you were really excited about and, you know, it could be a really big thing, but, um, you kind of had to distill it into important pieces. You're talking about, um, maybe a mom with the special needs, um, special needs example with a, with a child with special needs. And then maybe, you know, want to develop that or the, um, thinking back in your own experience, you wanted to have that a place where someone could call in the middle of the night if something happened. So, um, you know, and I'm sure you get a lot of those ideas with focus groups. So how, how did you, um, start to, and I, I know it builds in with, you know, sociology, but how did you grab those, find those people, grab them and figure out how to build a focus group that you could start to ask questions and poke into, um, the possible experience? Yeah. I mean, this is really part of what you train and as a sociologist, you know, mm-hmm. research methods. So that was not strange for me. And I'd done lots of research over the years, but, um, so I just basically, uh, tapped into my networks and the, and I have, because I was at Northwestern, I had the Chicago connection because I grew up in New York and then I had a bunch of friends in, um, Los Angeles. So I was able to just tap into networks and say, you know, I did in fact pay people to, I mean, focus groups, they're not just going to come running to you, Mm -hmm. you know? So, um, and I structured, uh, questionnaires and then open conversations. So I wanted to make sure that I did it in a way that was methodologically sound, you know, where I was going to get the most data. And, um, what I got out of it was that every single one was emotional. These were tough moms. These were resilient moms. These were moms that were independent. They didn't want, you know, we're, we say independent together at Esme, but they were ones that, you know, said, I don't really need help. But the more we dug, we, I realized that they that they, they could use support. And then when I talked about being the best mom they could be, that was the moment in every single group where the moms would get a little choked up mm. because they really, every mom wants to be the best they can be. And mm. they understood that this was a challenge because they had to do so much on their own. And so it would take a while in the, you know, and, and it's when things are replicated, right, you get to see a pattern. And I, the, I, the first three times I was like, Oh, this is crazy. They're all re- responding at this one juncture. Well then, you know, do it over and over again. You're like, wow, this is, I'm really hitting on something. Mm. And, um, you know, so we, we, a lot of the taglines for Esme, like solo doesn't mean alone, independent together, all these things came out of that very emotional experience of like talking to moms who were like, oh, I don't really need any help. I'm, I'm good. I'm good. Mm-hmm. And then realizing as it, we talk more and more, they, that places where they, they were vulnerable and where they felt like they could use the most support. Wow. Wow. And, and as I was listening to that, um, you know, that concept you just touched on being the best mom you can be. Um, I think, you know, you're talking about how maybe they, they felt independent. They felt strong. They said like, Oh, I can deal with this. Right. But when, when the conversation shifted to about being the best mom you can be, then it shifted from it. I can deal with this, but like, how are you being for your kids or how are you being for your future? You know, you, transition the thinking uh into moving beyond yourself and then all of a sudden they might realize like wait i'm not necessarily being the best i can be for them or for my future self so to speak do you agree with that yeah i mean i might phrase it a little bit but yeah we, we can um that they were there's a lot of guilt and mm-hmm. there's a lot of feeling like you know i mean society's not telling them that they're great moms right so they're always facing a stigma of perhaps you know oh you know, we, we hear politicians blaming single moms for, you know, situations. And so, you know, they're fighting that. And then they're fighting the internal stress of like, it's really hard work. It's like every single day you have the responsibility of, mm-hmm. of so much so that, you know, and I, you know, I challenge any, any parent usually feels like they're not doing like the most amazing parent, but you know, for these moms, it's really excruciatingly difficult because, they know that they have to spread themselves so thin. And we, there was just an article called I can't split myself in half. And it was a woman writing about her two kids, like kind of tugging at her, like she couldn't, you know, she would take care of one and then the other she couldn't. And so, you know, and, and a lot of people can relate to that. So I think it's really tapping into like, yeah, you might be really good, but we all want to be better. And if there's guilt, that's part of that whole dialogue then you know I, I thought and I think that's where where it really came out it was like 
Um, yeah, I really need to do, do for myself probably a little bit more going back to the self care and realizing yeah. that they, they, they were pretty strung out. They're pretty tired. They're pretty overworked. And, uh, you know, I wasn't trying to poke and get that, but it, it did come out. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, yeah, exactly. I mean, yeah. And- you you unearthed you unearthed uh, I th- I think a very important point in there and again it's just you know it's so interesting listening to you because I think um, I could be giving this same conversation but in the perspective of kind of the physician burnout and uh, doctor burnout space um, so it's it's interesting to hear that so you touched on um, some self care techniques so let me ask you Marika. Um, what are some things you do when you're feeling stressed out? What do you love to do to kind of uh, take care of yourself? Well, I have to go back to nature, going yeah. outside, taking a walk, um, just breathing. I'm pretty good at, I'm actually pretty good at self care. I, uh, I like to do Pilates. Um, I like to read. I, I, to make, do things that I think are really fun with my kids, like getting outside and just having like kind of blowing off steam, running around, getting a little crazy. So, um, you know, but basically that being in touch with the uh, nature and walking with my dogs and, you know, looking at the water, the mountains, I think that's like, that's the most restorative stuff that I do. Mm, that's yeah. amazing. And uh, again, I think, you know, it comes back to your culture. You're talking about just part of part of being in nature. And I think, you know, again, we talk about like modern society, we get so stuck in, I mean, even us, we're talking on a digital platform, right? <laughs> right. but, um, but it's also awesome because it's a, it's a tool we can use to connect. Um, but that, that's great. Um, who, who do you think has been uh, a very influential person in your life? Um, or, uh, maybe a recent book that you read that influenced you in some way? Oh, wow. Um, the most influential person in my life is my great aunt. Mm-hmm. And she's a woman in Sweden who was a nurse for a very large, um, area of a rural area in Sweden. She had this old sob that she would drive around and she did everything from like take fish hooks out of, you know, people's arms to deliver babies to, and, uh, you know, she passed away about eight years ago, mm-hmm. but I spent so much time. She had her, she took care of a very wealthy woman with cancer and she inherited her home, which was overlooking a beautiful part of, a, you know, a lake. And so she took over that house and I would spend weekends with her. And I just learned so much about like her struggles, her journeys. And she was up, never married, mm. never had kids. And just everyone knew her because she had taken care of everyone in the, the local area. I mean, she just, everyone had either had, you know, she'd come over when they had a fever or whatever. I mean, it's just, it was really just profound that of how many people in that community she took care of. Wow. Almost sounds like she was a super mom. I know <laughs> she was uh, really quite remarkable. Yeah, it was yeah. just like almost like a community mother, like uh, not necessarily of her own children, but taking care of you know the people, the area itself. That's that's really great. I love that yeah. story. Um, yeah. Was uh, has there been a recent book or maybe a, um, a speaker? Anyone that recently impact you in that way? Well, I have to say, you know, the fabulous book, When Breath Becomes Air, Mm. you know. I'm not familiar with that one. Oh, um, I'm going to totally mess up his name, but it's written by a physician, a Stanford doctor. Okay. Who um, finds out that he has terminal lung cancer Mm. and he's he's a resident. And it's Kalanthi. That's right. So you have to read this book. Apparently (laughs) apparently I do, especially if it's in my space. Yeah. yeah, it's so it's when breath becomes air and he finds out that he's has terminal lung cancer and he writes the most beautiful memoir. I've, you know, just incredible. And um, it just sticks with me because I think about appreciating now and the moment. And he does talk. I, actually, you're going to love this book. I can't even <laughs> believe it. Yeah, we uh, we did a piece on his wife because they decided to have a child, even though he knew he was dying. Mm. And so now she's a solo mom. But uh this book is just so full of beauty and living in the moment and connecting with his family and realizing, you know, a lot about medicine, you know, realizing that uh, the way he had been practicing probably wasn't the way he didn't like it when he learned when he was a patient, what he discovered. Mm. So, um, yeah, I completely, this is, I, I, I almost feel like you have to call me back after awesome. you read it. <laughs> we'll have to do a, a check-in call to see that. that exactly. Sounds like a great, a great read. Very inspiring. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And to listeners, definitely check that out as well. Yeah. Um, 
So uh, since this is the happy doc, um, I have to ask this question. What what excites you? What are moments that excite you? What makes you fulfilled? Oh my goodness. I actually have so many of those. I am such, I am a bit of a Pollyanna where I wake up and every day I feel optimistic and excited. <laughs> <laughs> so um, when my kids um, accomplish something or when they show an act of kindness mm-hmm. and, you know, unexpectedly, uh, I, when I have written something and people are like, can relate to it, that just gets me really charged up. Collaboration is something I just love. I, I mean, our team, a way of working together and we'll have meetings and we'll laugh and we'll play mm-hmm. ping pong. And <laughs> awesome. But um, yeah, so it's mostly, you know, just the fulfillment of knowing that you're trying to stay true to yourself and, you know, fulfilling the mission of your project. And then just with my kids, just, you know, the it's, I mean, I have five children. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so it's just really exciting to see as they grow and when they you know, what, what they achieve and just those sweet moments that are unexpected and you see something pretty great. That's amazing. And, and so the term we use there, and that's actually part of our mission. And I'm, I'm sure you like this term too. It's called confelicity. Mm-hmm. Um, confelicity means finding joy in another person's happiness. Um, so you, you find intrinsic joy from gearing people or helping people find their own happiness. Um, and so that's, uh, that's a lot of kind of what I'm hearing. And obviously family is so huge. So um, no, that's amazing. That's amazing. So, um, you know, I think we're coming up towards the end of our conversation for today. Um, something I wanted to ask you, um, is what do you, what do you think is maybe a theme or a tip that you might want to leave to the listeners today? Uh, I, I'm going to go back to that one that we've been talking about all along is, uh, self-care and self-care through a a mindfulness and a, a love for yourself. Mm. loving yourself by being, you know, forgiving yourself and by, um, saying no, you know, saying no to things that, you know, some, when you, when your gut tells you it's wrong and that you're pushing too hard, you know, listen to it. So I guess my tip is, um, self-care and self-love. You got to look for it. Keep fine. You know, you'll have days when you're not practicing it, but just keep searching for it because, uh, each time you practice this, these, um, types of self-care and self-love you just feel better and you're going to just be a better person and you're going to it's going to overflow that's so, awesome awesome yeah um and then was there anything that you felt like you wanted to touch on or speak about that maybe i didn't ask it's okay if you don't have anything yeah no no i think we're we had a nice <laughs> conversation <laughs> awesome and uh yeah. so with that being said everyone again we had uh marika lynn home with us today it was an absolute pr- pleasure to have you i want um Everyone to check out our website. It's esme.com or esme.com. The website is really beautiful, by the way. Lots of great links. Again, I'm not a solo mom. Maybe I'm not the right market, but definitely, um, you know, I'm, I'm fascinated by it. I think it's a great, you know, just talking about it and taking a look at the page. Uh, just a great resource. I want everyone to check it out. Um, and it was an absolute pleasure to have you today, Marika. I, I enjoyed speaking with you, Taylor. Thank you. All right. Well, take care. Okay. Okay, bye. Hey guys, we hope you enjoyed this episode and we want you to definitely subscribe to our social media channels. Check out The Happy Doc on Facebook, iTunes, Twitter, and Instagram. Please like, subscribe, share, and send us feedback. And please check out the website www.thehappydoc.com. Again, we hope you enjoyed the happy dog, the voice of fulfilled physicians. Peace out.